For your, uh, please look for the tasks to complete list on the Science 2 Canvas homepage. This is Unit 1, Lesson 8, U1L8. So you can either look underneath assignments or go to the uh, homepage and scroll all the way to the weekly calendar on the bottom. Remember, you are B period, Science 2B, uh, and look for U1L8. And those are the tasks we're going to complete. Uh, homework review. I don't think there's going to be many questions about this. Please just make sure that you have submitted a photo of your sun notes and Mercury and Venus notes from our previous presentations. Uh, if you missed those, you can find the video on Canvas as well. So just watch them on your own time and take some notes and submit a photo. Uh, please make sure you submitted the um, feedback survey. Remember, the survey was anonymous, so I can't see if you did it or not. You have to type done into the word box on the assignment itself. So if you didn't do that, do that. That's how you're going to get your, your participation points. So make sure you did that kind of extra step there. Um, and just make sure you're ready for the project, which looks like most of you have replied to the uh, discussion board, so we're good to go there. Uh, any questions or comments on the homework? And again, if Canvas is giving you a hard time with file uploads, you can email things to me uh, if you need to, uh, but that should be kind of like the last, last minute thing, so. All right, let's see what you remember from our Sun presentation. I have a short little Kahoot that we're gonna play through that is somewhat based on the presentation you all heard on the sun. So if you're not sure about something, just take your best guess. Uh, I assume you are familiar with cahoots. Um, all right, let me share my screen here. Here we go. So you're gonna go to kahoot.it. And enter in the game pin 137886, or if you have the Kahoot app on your phone, you can do that. Um, please use your actual name or something close to it. Awesome, all right, we got everybody now. But domain code is always uh, available on the bottom of the screen to get kicked out. Let's do this. 10 questions. The sun is the center of what? Nice, most of you got it. It is indeed the solar system. It is not the universe, uh, though I do wonder what is at the center of our universe, but I guess from the Big Bang Theory, everything's spreading out from uh, everything else, so it's kind of hard to identify a center. Quinn in the lead, Claudia close behind. Here we go. The sun represents what percent of the solar system's mass? This is straight out of the Hewitt reading. Nicely done, right? Yeah, not, not 9.8, I guess how yeah, that threw you off. Uh, but 99.8%, pretty mind boggling. Um, especially when you think about how the sun doesn't necessarily take up 99.8% of the space. I mean, it is big, but all right. Quinn's still in the lead, Wiley catching up now. What is the reaction pictured below? This might not have been in the presentation, but take your best guess. about half of you got it. it is nuclear fusion there's so much pressure i think this did come up in the presentation about how much pressure there is in the core of the sun and it forces hydrogen atoms together to form helium we call that fusion it generates tons of energy hey wiley's taking the lead alex close behind the sun's diameter is roughly how many times the size of earth's diameter and i'll warn you it's not as big as you might think Wow, okay, yeah, three of you got it. It is actually only 100 times, which again, is pretty mind-boggling to think if you, you had to line up 100 Earths 
to go from one end of the sun to the other. Uh, but yeah, you, we picture the sun, we think it's a lot bigger. All right, Wiley maintaining the lead. Halfway point now, question five. The sun's mass is how many times that of Earth's mass? So it's 100 times the diameter. What's the mass difference? Nice, only three of you got it. It is uh, 1,300,000 times the mass. Again, kind of relates to that whole 99.8% of the mass of the universe. Or I guess, sorry, of our solar system, I should say. All right, why is it still in the lead? Here we go. Which portion of the sun is closest to the Earth? They talked about the layers of the sun, so which layer is closest to the Earth? But have you got it? It is indeed the corona, uh, which is a word we will always associate with negative things now. All right, so I've taken the lead. Here we go. Which state of matter requires the highest temperature? Very good, most of you got it, it is indeed plasma, which is kind of the next level up from gas. Uh, but gas was a good guess. So still in the lead, Wiley's making a comeback though. The sun uses what to produce prodigious amounts of energy? The hint I'll give you is this kind of a re repeat question. Very good, it is nuclear fusion. Again, bringing two hydrogens together to make helium. Oh, Wiley pulling ahead again. Second to last question, true, false. The sun produces a magnetic field. Very good, it is true. We learned about how comets have tails and talked a little bit about the aurora borealis here on Earth too as a result of uh, the magnetic interaction between the sun and Earth. Alex now in the lead, here we go, last question. The solar wind is what? What is solar wind? Nice, most of you got it. It is a stream of electrically charged particles. This was brought up in relation to the um, Aurora Borealis earlier as well. All right, let's see how we did. Way to go, Quinn. Hey, <laughs> Harry coming from behind. <laughs> Nicely done. All right, let's leave all that noise there. Okay, well done. Everyone feeling good about the sun? That was an illuminating Kahoot, right? Uh, all righty. So uh, next task then is to start our presentations. Uh, first group we're gonna be hearing from is Molly and Claudia talking about Earth, Mars, and how we might get to Mars. Uh, so, same expectations for listeners as last time. You need to have a notebook or piece of paper in front of you to take notes. So you should write down the title of the first presentation, which is Inner Planets, Earth, and Mars. And again, this is going to be Molly and Claudia presenting to us first. Uh, Molly and Claudia, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to open the slides to go through, or does one of you want to do it? I can do it if you want. Yeah, OK. I'll make you a co-host so you can share your screen. Um, it's a good idea, too, if you've got a video or anything else you want to use, it's good to preload that, too. You can take a moment right now. So, okay, I just made you a co-host, so you should have screen share options. So,
Uh, and again, I'll, I'll set a timer. I mean, again, hopefully you don't go longer than 15 minutes. That will be, I'll give you a little warning at that point, but most groups have been around nine to 10 minutes. Um, Claudia, are you feeling ready? Yes. Okay, uh, then I think we are ready to go when you are. Okay. So today, Claudia and I are gonna be talking about the inner planets, specifically Earth and Mars, and how humans plan to reach Mars. So important vocabulary is you should know that the, habitas, the habitable zone is a region that is not too close and it's not too far from the sun and it, it, it allows water to exist on these planets. So if you look at the picture over here, it shows Mars. And in 12.5 billion years, the habitable zone will shift and Jupiter and Saturn will then be in the habitable zone. So the carbon dioxide cycle is a thermostat that keeps global temperatures from reaching harsh extremes. And the magnet, the magnosphere. I think it's magneto, magnetosphere. Oh, thank you. Is the region surrounding the earth or another astronomical body in which its magnetic field is predominant effective magnetic field. And that's kind of what, uh, oh, if you go back two slides, that's what was coming up in that Kahoot a little bit, right? And um, that's emitted from the sun and, and Earth actually has its own that protects us from a lot of those harmful things from the sun, which you may or may not mention. I think it was mentioned last in our last presentations too. The other thing, uh, the carbon dioxide cycle. So wait, because I've been hearing all the stuff about how bad CO2 is and it's, you know, we're pumping our atmosphere full of it, but would you say it's true that we actually do need some carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? Yes. We do. Uh, again, common misunderstanding. So cool. All right, keep going. Okay. So the major properties of Earth is, Earth is 71% water, 34.6% iron, 29.5% oxygen, 15.2% silicon, 12.7% magnesium, 2.4% nickel, 1.9% sulfur, and 0.05% titanium. And Earth is 5.2 grams per cubic inch. That's its density. And Earth is one of the densest bodies in our solar system, which a lot of people don't know, considering the size. And um, Mars is, and it has less than 1% oxygen, which means that if we were to go to Mars, we would not be able to breathe on our own if we're on Mars, because there is not enough oxygen for us so we would need um say an oxygen tank or something else to help us breathe and the average temperature on mars is negative 80 degrees fahrenheit and march mars has a very thin atmosphere so thin that sometimes when satellites are put into mars's atmosphere they can be pushed out by winds that then the uh, satellites get lost and it kind of goes to show how thin the atmosphere is and it can not hold very much in it. Kind of uh, going, back on, of going back to that too real quick, the, um, you know, it, it explains too why even though the planet is 95% carbon dioxide, which is normally very good at capturing heat, right? That's what's heating up our own atmosphere. Uh, but you make a good point about it. It's so thin, the atmosphere, that it doesn't, even though there's, there's such a large proportion percent of carbon dioxide, the atmosphere is so thin that it doesn't capture enough heat. So hence, Mars actually has freezing temperatures on the surface. So, yeah. cool. So the size of Earth and Mars. Earth is the fifth, fifth largest planet in our solar system. And you're not necessarily going to need to know these numbers, but I'm going to say them anyway. <laughs> Um, its radius is 6,371 kilometers. Its mass is 5.99. Really, really big. Yeah, yeah, very big. Its volume is also very big. And um, Mars, its radius is 3,396 kilometers, which is only 53% of Earth and of Earth's radius and its mass 
is 15% of Earth's um, mass, and its volume is 0.151% of Earth's volume. And um, orbit period. So an orbit period is the time that it takes for a planet to complete one revolution around the sun. So, I mean, as you know, one, um, one orbit period on Earth is 365 days, which we call an, a year. And on Mars, the, it, Mars's orbit period is 686.98 days, which is 1.9 Earth years. And uh, if you kind of see in the picture, it kind of shows that the further away from the sun the planet is, the longer the orbit period, because obviously it has more distance to travel. And a rotation period. So Earth rotates on the axis of rotation every 24 sidereal, sidereal hours. Yeah, I have no or, idea what that means. Sidereal yeah. hours. I guess it's that's um, of, like how they're read. Yeah, yeah. so it are, <laughs> uh, we actually go around um, the axis a little over once every 24 hours, considering that it we really go around 20 in th 23 hours and 56 minutes on a regular clock. And basically the axis of rotation on Earth is an imaginary line that goes through the North and South Pole. So that's kind of interesting. And on Mars, the rotation period is, um, oh, so its axis of rotation rotates 25 degrees and it's the, and the planet completes its rotation in 24.6 hours. So Mars and, um, Mars and Earth's rotation periods are so similar that if you're out in space and you're looking at them rotate, it looks like they are moving together, that they're moving so similar in speeds. Nice. Cool thing too about the, um, the wobble that rotates 25 degrees, meaning like it, it wobbles back and forth on its axis, which uh, Earth does as well, though not as dramatically, but that's what produces seasons. Um, so even though Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, it does technically have seasons just like Earth, like there's kind of a winter and a summer and how much daylight is uh, each part of the planet gets. Um, and in terms of the orbital period, so yeah, we don't actually, we, everyone knows a day is 24 hours. It's actually not true, we're just short of it. Uh, so they have to add a day to the calendar about every four years to compensate for that lost time. Does anyone know what that's called? It's leap year, right? Yeah, that's the leap year. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Claudia. Okay, so Earth has one moon, obviously. The moon relatively stabilizes climate for Earth and is also the source of our tide creation. The moon's distance from distance the distance from Earth is about two hundred and thirty nine thousand miles. It takes twenty seven Earth days for the moon to make a full orbit around Earth. Um, the minimum temperature the moon can get to is negative two hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and the maximum is two hundred and sixty degrees Fahrenheit. For Mars, Mars has two moons, and their names are Phobos and Deimos, I think you pronounce it. Phobos is the inner moon, which is closer to Mars, and Deimos is the outer moon. Phobos orbits around Mars three times a day, while Deimos takes 30 hours to make a complete orbit. The they look moon, like uh, potatoes, don't they? Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, the moons may be captured asteroids from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, Earth's composition of air consists of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon, 0.04% carbon, and 0.04% carbon dioxide. There has also been trace amounts of neon, helium, methane, krypton, and hydrogen, as well as water vapor. There are five main layers to Earth's atmosphere, the exosphere, the thermosphere, the mesosphere, the stratosphere, and the troposphere. The yes, we'll be learning about those later. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere of Mars is about 100 times thinner than Earth. So like Molly said before, it's very thin. Um, Mars composition consists of 95% carbon dioxide, 9.59% nitrogen, 1.94% argon, and 
0.161% oxygen and 0.058% carbon monoxide. And uh, good composition there. If you go back one, the um, you often see photos of Mars and, and you see white like like polar caps on the on the very top and bottom of Mars. And while there's probably some water there, it turns out that um, most of that is actually frozen carbon dioxide. It's dry ice because um, the temperature and pressure conditions are just right. Uh, and there's so much carbon dioxide in the air that it, that it goes into solid form. So anyway, cool. So on Earth, each step we take, we fall forward while walking in an up and down motion through gravity. The optimal walking speed on Mars will be 3.4 kilometers down from 5.5 kilometers on Earth. And the work done per unit distance to move the center of mass will be half of that on Earth. An astronaut walking on Mars would take less energy than walking on Earth. Walking on Mars is a little more than half of terrestrial average, meaning they will walk slower and conserve more of their energy. So these two very short videos will explain like how to get to Mars and how to land on Mars. So. <laughs> Sorry, guys. How do you get to Mars? If you want to send a spacecraft all the way to Mars, first you'll need a fast rocket to escape the pull of Earth's gravity. The heavier your spacecraft, the more powerful your rocket needs to be to lift off. Next, make sure you launch at the right time. Mars and Earth orbit the Sun at different speeds and distances. Sometimes they're really far apart, and other times they come closer together. About every two years, the two planets are in perfect positions to get to Mars with the least amount of rocket fuel. That's important. The total trip is over 300 million miles. Finally, make sure your aim is right. You can't shoot for where Mars is at launch time. You have to aim for where it will be when you get there. It's a lot like how a quarterback passes a football. Also, you may need a few thrusts to correct your direction along the way so you don't miss Mars. If all goes well, you'll get to the red planet in about seven or eight months. Then, if you actually want to land on Mars, well, that's a whole other challenge. Nice. Yeah, that's mind-boggling to me that they, you know, they'll launch for a, a spot where the planet isn't there yet. And, and while they're flying, the planet arrives and then they land on it. <laughs> it's crazy. How do you land on Mars? Wait, is this Very the same one? No, yeah. it's the landing on Mars. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Carefully. Your spacecraft hurtles toward the planet at thousands of miles per hour, so you'll have to hit the brakes in a hurry. First, your capsule needs a heat shield. It protects the spacecraft inside from the heat and friction of entry into the atmosphere. Friction slows you down over 90%, but not enough to land safely. Use a parachute to slow down even more. Still, falling at over 100 miles per hour, you need the right system to land safely. Here are some options. With a small to mid-sized rover, use a cushion of airbags along with retro rockets. Impact at 30 miles an hour and bounce to a stop. With a large lander, use retro rockets and landing legs to touch down going about six miles an hour. Or with a large heavy rover, use a big jet pack to slow down to under two miles an hour. Then gently lower it on tables to land on its wheels. Any way you do it, you'll need skill and hard work. There's nothing easy about landing on Mars. Nice. Uh, it's funny because all those uh, examples they showed you are ones that they've used. Uh, the rovers, the first rover landed on those little like balloon cushion things. Um, I think the second one had that little like top capsule that kind of dropped it down and let, let it go at the right moment, um, which is all fine for a robot. You know, they can experience a lot of G-force and can, can stop and start suddenly. Uh, do you think it would be easy on a human body to do something like that? No. No. Right. So yeah, we'd have to change things up. Yeah, those are great. So for Elon Musk, Elon Musk's website provides a generous amount of information regarding his mission Mars plan. The spacecraft he plans on releasing to Mars is called Starship, and Starship has claimed to carry up to 100 people up to Mars. It will be the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed with the ability to carry in excess of 100 metric tons to Earth's orbit. The design has yet to be finalized, but that picture right there is what they are planning for it to look like. Starship, spacecraft, and super, super heavy rocket work together to represent a full reusable transportation system while carrying both crew and cargo to Earth's orbit, the moon, Mars, and beyond. 
Refilling on orbit enables the transport of up to 100 tons all the way to Mars. The cost of oxygen and methane is extremely low, so if the tanker ship has high reuse capability, the primary cost is that of the propellant. It is capable of on-orbit refueling and lever leveraging Mars's natural H2O and CO2 resources to refuel on the surface of Mars. For landing on Mars, they will expect to see ablation of the heat shield due to the vehicle coming into Mars's atmosphere so hot, but the heat shield is designed to withstand multiple scenarios. M multiple scenarios. There will just be an act of wear and tear. Here is the simulation of Starship landing on Mars from SpaceX's website. Nice. And uh, the super heavy, those rockets are referring to are those reusable ones that SpaceX uses. They, they launch into space and then they come back down. If you haven't seen footage of that, you should check it out. It's really cool. Just scroll all the way to the bottom. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right there. Oh, okay. see website. Got it. Yeah, it's really fancy. Hmm. So this is it coming down on Mars's surface? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they talked about ablation of the heat shield, meaning they're just they're just hitting the atmosphere really fast. And even though the atmosphere is thin, I guess it's enough to still do something. Yeah. Yeah, no, we don't have to watch the whole thing. Okay. Right? Okay. Cool. Let's through through it. Kind of slowly go go down. Over here. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, it seems pretty crazy, but again, everyone, you know, no one thought that the reusable rocket idea that SpaceX is now using would work and they got it to work, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh-oh, the, the little zoom thing is kind of in the way of- Oh, you can click it and drag it. Um, I think if you just click and drag on part of it, you can drag it out of the way. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, or if that doesn't work, then you can click and drag your, your Chrome window. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. There we go. So there's been a total of eight successful US satellite landings on Mars, and these are only five of them. So the first satellite to come near Mars to take close up photos of the planet's surface is called Mariner 4, which launched in 1965. And Mariner 6 and 7 were launched to transmit information about the planet's surface and atmosphere. Mariner 9 launched, launched a spacecraft to orbit a uh, to Mariner 6 and 7 were launched to transmit information about the planet's surface and atmosphere. Mariner 9 launches in 1971, becoming the first U.S. spacecraft to orbit a, plane, a planet other than Earth. Um, fast forwarding to 2011, after many other launches and landings, the rover named Curiosity is launched and successfully lands on Mars in 2012. In 2018, InSight lands on Mars and begin, begins sending signals to NASA minutes later, including a photo of the surface where it landed. Not all satellites that I mentioned actually landed on Mars, but did collect information. So like you can see that the models and technology have progressed over like the past 55 years. So like all the models look like really new compared to the old ones. Mm -hmm. And that's all, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, can everyone unmute yourselves, please? Round of applause from around the world. Well done. Yeah, detailed history there, the rovers and stuff. Uh, any questions or comments or feedback for this group and our experts on Mars and Earth? How many of you have seen the movie The Martian with uh, Matt Damon? Usually a good number of people. Anyone read the book? Oh, I should definitely check out the book if you haven't read the book. But um, yeah, kind of a fun little take. Uh, not quite realistic. Uh, they get the kind of thin atmosphere thing a little wrong as well, some of the content of the soil. But um, good job on, on that. OK, if there's no other questions or comments, we will move on to group number four. Uh, we're going to be hearing about the outer planets now. So we made our way through the inner planets. Now we're to the outer planets. Uh, so again, in your notes, make a new line, outer planets this time around. And we'll be hearing from um, 
lost my list here, of course. Uh, Joyce, Angel, and Lauren. Um, Lauren, are you going to be helping or? I know I think you've been out a little bit, right? Um, I'm not sure. I only added like videos into it, so I don't really okay. know about the information that's on there yet. Okay, all right. Well, uh, Joyce and uh, um, Angel will let you run things then. We can check out your videos at the end, Lauren, or anything you added. Okay, uh, Joyce, Angel, and Lauren, how do you want to do this? So, when you want to pull it up, or do you want me to pull up the uh, slides and go through them as you talk? Um, I can share my screen. Okay. I think Angel's been dropping in and out. Is is Angel here? Are we missing him? We are missing him. Oh uh, yeah, I'm here. It's just oh, hey. it's been really yeah, yeah. bad. I don't know yeah, I know. I've been I've been rejoining you. So, all right. Well, let's let's hope it holds. <laughs> if not, you can uh, Claudia and uh, Lauren can just wing it. Uh, all right, so Claudia, I'm going to make you a co-host. You should be able to then share your screen. Everyone else, just make sure you've wrapped up your notes on the inner planets and are ready to take notes on the outer. Um, the I already presented, Mr. Hay. <laughs> oh, my bad. Sorry. Who? Oh, yeah, sorry. Who am I looking for? Joyce. Oh, uh, Joyce. My bad. Joyce, you said you're gonna you're gonna do it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, no, Claudia, you're going to present again. Again. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm pretty sure I made you a co-host. Yes, okay. Joyce, so you're set. All right, so the outer planets, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune by Joyce, Angel, and Lauren. Okay, so what are the outer planets? All four planets are made up of gases and have rings spinning around them. Um, they also have large numbers of moons orbiting around them. Uh, our first planet is Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is called a, the giant gas planet. It's covered in giant, thick, red, brown, and yellow white clouds. Uh, Jupiter is also the largest planet in the solar system. It's mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. The temperature of the Jupiter is about negative 145 degrees Celsius. There's no firm surface on Jupiter, so if you were to stand on Jupiter, you would just sink down and get crushed by the pressure. Uh, the little red spot on Jupiter is a storm that's been going on for the last, for at least 306 years. Also, Jupiter has 79 moons. They also, um, I mean, and that storm is like, isn't it like several hundred times the size of Earth too or something like that? It's something crazy. It's like so yeah. huge. Um, cool. Uh, our second planet is Saturn. It's the second largest planet in the solar system. It's mostly made out of helium and hydrogen, just like Jupiter. It has a metallic core made out of metals like iron and nickel. Saturn has a temperature of negative 285 degrees Fahrenheit. A Saturn also doesn't have a surface if you try to walk on it. Uh, if you try to walk on Saturn, you would fall into the planet and get crushed by the temperatures and pressures. Saturn has 62 moons. The ring around Saturn is made up of little parts of asteroids, shattered moons, comets, and etc. Okay, Uranus. Um, so Uranus is the seventh planet from the sun. And it was also the first planet found using a telescope. It has nine inner rings and two outer rings. Um, its properties are water, methane, and ammonia ice, and it's 80% um, of its mass. It also orbits around the sun on its side, so its tilt causes seasons to last for about 20 years. Um, its size is 31,763 miles, and one day is 17 Earth hours, and for a complete orbit around the sun, it would take 84 Earth years. Um, it also has 27 moons. Its largest moons are Oberon and Titania. It's composed of hydrogen and helium. And if an astronaut stood on the surface, it would just sink into the icy center. Nice. Uh, go back one. Um, yeah, again, a lot of people don't realize this, and it's hard to see in the picture, but yeah, it does have rings. Um, all the outer planets actually have them. And uh, you can find pictures of Uranus that um, it's tilted on its side, which is kind of what you're getting there with the seasons lasting so long. Um, you know, you think of Earth having north-south, Uranus is technically then on its side that way, right? It's spinning, um, like it got tilted over and that's how it's spinning. And so the rings reflect that as well, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, and yeah, all these planets, they spin so fast. That's what's really crazy about the gas giants and maybe one reason why the atmospheres are so violent, but cool. Um, Neptune. So Neptune is the farthest planet from the sun, and it spins on its axis very rapidly. It has six faint rings, and it's a 
Its properties are a mix of water, ammonia, and methane. Its size is 15,299 miles. And one day on Neptune is 16 hours, 16 Earth hours. And one year on Neptune is 165 Earth years. It also has a very active climate. For example, um, one of the storms called the Great Dark Spot lasted for about five years. And it also has 14 moons. Its components are methane, which is what gives Neptune its deep blue color. And if an astronaut were to stand on its surface, they would just sink down into, um, into it. I can't really see it because the zoom thing. You can move things around, but uh, yeah, it has gaseous layers. Yeah. Yeah, and again, just really shows that all these planets are spinning really, really fast. Like they have super short, like again, um, 16 hours uh, in a day, technically. Um, whereas, uh, but they rotate much, much slower or orbit. And again, it makes sense in the previous presentation because they're much farther away, so. And um, here are some videos of, of each of the planets. Oh, I think it takes a while to go over. These are actual images, right? This is a very artistic planet. Yeah. All of the planets in our solar system, it has probably the most structure, the most color. So it connects with the artist. But the idea that you can couple our scientific imaging and understanding of the planet with artistic representations of not only what the planet means, but what exploration means, has been very valuable to the mission and to the public. One of the coolest things about Juno is that we have a camera on board, it's called JunoCam. It's what we call a citizen science camera. JunoCam is on the space park. Um, yeah, I'll show the next video. Yeah, I wonder how much of this is based on real images too, or just rendered. Um, and then this is Uranus. That's cool. Neptune. Now we have some hints from Earth based observations that Neptune had a few clouds and it was that way better than Uranus. But we really weren't prepared for the spectacular weather activity that we have in In fact, Neptune is the windiest planet in the solar system, and I was totally unprepared for that. The winds are 325 
meters per second. That's the speed that the great dark spot is moving relative to the inside of Neptune. Everything's going to the east, but the great dark spot is going more slowly to the east than the inside of Neptune. We had expected, because Neptune does, is not just on its side as a planet, but is an upright planet, that the magnetic field acts, the axis would be aligned with the rotation axis, that is, the poles would be near the rotational pole. And we were surprised again, the magnetic field is tilted by 47 degrees in the case of Neptune, and its center of the magnetic field is offset by almost two-thirds of the radius of the planet. Its magnetic field is somewhat weaker, only about half of that of Saturn's, for instance, at the surface, uh, and its magnetic field extends only about 400,000 miles from the surface. We did uh, discover that the rotation period of the magnetic field uh, is about uh, 16 hours and 7 minutes, faster than Uranus, but slower than both Jupiter and Saturn. Um, okay. Nice. Is that it? Uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. All right, have everyone unmute yourselves, please. Round of applause. Well done. Questions or comments on uh, the outer planets? Thought that video footage was really cool. It's cool seeing the actual. Um, I encourage everyone to go look up the uh, images of Saturn in particular, or um, Jupiter. Just the way the ga the wavy gases and stuff. It, it looks really cool. Um, I'm really fascinated by looking at some of that stuff. And that I think they've gotten some pretty good close-up images. Um, it's interesting to see the like Saturn and Uranus, Neptune are so much harder to reach. Um, really beautiful model of how Neptune's like tilted on to access the axis though as well, and the way it's spinning. Um, seems kind of weird. Uh, you wonder what that says about the core and stuff, but um, awesome. All right, well, thank you very much to the groups who presented. Um, for everyone who is listening, make sure you have wrapped up your notes on those presentations and submit photos to the associated assignments. Uh, they're right there on Canvas. That's part of the homework on the bottom of the tasks to complete list. Obviously, if you gave the presentation, you don't have to submit an image of notes for it. Uh, okay. So last thing I wanted to touch on in our last few minutes here was um, grading. I'm still working on catching up on my grading, so you don't have grades entered for everything on Canvas. I'm gonna try to do that this weekend. This is sort of a reporting period. It's not, um, we're not publishing grades, but if you've got a lot of missing assignments and things like that, you'll be getting notes from your teachers. Uh, and so I wanted to show you, I'm hoping most of you are aware of this already, but if you're not, um, note that if you go to the Science 2, uh, Canvas homepage, and I thought I had one open, but uh, I'll just go home here. And I'll go into student view just so you can see, I mean, it doesn't make that big of a difference, but. Come on now. Look at the menu on the left side. You've got home, announcements, assignments, discussions. And what I want to draw your attention to is grades. If you click on grades, it takes you to a list of all the assignments we've done in Science 2 so far. It shows you the score that I've entered for anything that I have graded. If I wrote you a little note, there's like a little notepad image. You can click on it. You can see any notes that I might have written to you. Uh, it tells you if anything's missing. Uh, and that's usually just means that if there's a submission required, it hasn't received it yet. So I encourage you to go check this out and try to keep track. If you've got something that's missing or not submitted, um, please do so. Uh, my policy is that I'm never going to give zeros for missing assignments. I will always guarantee you at least half the points. So you get 50%. Um, that's still not a passing grade, but it's not like a zero. It's not going to drag your grade down. Uh, my other policy is that you can always submit work. So even if it's super, super late, um, as long as you get things done and into me, I can grade them and I can give you some credit for them, right? The point is that you're doing the work. Um, and so please use that as a good resource. Um, check for anything that you might be missing. Uh, again, I will do my best to uh, catch up on grading over this weekend and in the coming week. And let me know if you need help on anything. I'm happy to walk you through stuff. Okay. So homework is a lot of the same old stuff. Make sure you're catching up on missing assignments. 
Uh, the next groups that we're gonna hear from, please make sure you are ready to present. That's gonna be Sean and Quinn on life in our solar system and Sophie Flores and Jessica on Earth's moon. Please make sure you're submitting photos of all of your notes to the um, associated assignments. And the next thing is gonna be a little activity we're gonna do. Since we learned about the inner and outer planets now, I wanna do a little drawing activity where you're gonna be drawing the planets to scale. And so this is the one other little homework thing. It's on the bottom of the task to complete list is drawing the planets to scale. You're gonna need your compass for this. Hopefully most of you have gotten your compass for drawing circles. Uh, I have written instructions and video instructions on the assignment itself, but you're gonna draw all eight planets on a single piece of paper. It should look something like this. You don't have to show them in, or in order or anything like that. We already did that with our spacing, you know, walking the solar system thing. Um, but instead you're gonna use a compass and you can color them in later, but you really see how big the outer planets are and then these inner planets are just these tiny little things. Um, but again, I have written instructions in a video that will guide you through all that and you just need to submit a photo of your drawing when you are done. Any questions on the homework? Uh, let's see, Angel asked a question. Can you draw them in order if you want? Yes, you can. Um, it's gonna be a little hard to fit them on the paper. You could be able to pull it off, but um, you wanna make sure you can fit on one sheet of paper is gonna be my one thing. Or, I mean, honestly, if you wanna draw them in order, that's fine, and just maybe tape two pieces of paper together, and you can just submit two photos of it. So, good question, Angel. Any others? Okay, uh, with that, then honestly, I know we still have like eight more minutes left, but I am going to let you go. Lauren, I'm gonna ask you to hang out just for a little bit afterwards, if that's okay with you. Otherwise, everyone else, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you.